Jesus. Amen. And amen. God bless you as you come and give. Today we want to welcome our online audience and let you know that you can give online at hopi.cc. Uh, there's also a text to give. The number's on the screen. And by the way, I didn't do this when I got up here. I should have. We want to welcome all the visitors that are here today. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, you can text the word welcome to that number on the screen there or scan the QR code and fill out the information that comes up and send it to us. We would greatly appreciate it. We're honored that you are here with us today. And we hope that uh, you are touched and blessed by the service. Amen. It's going, rain, it's going to rain on Sunday. Just ask all the preachers. They'll tell you about it. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. It's important that you're here. I don't, I don't know. Uh, sometimes as a pastor, you, you try to explain things to people. But um, as God leads in, in the teaching and the discipleship of a congregation, uh, there are, are certain... Um, I call them learning blocks that uh, are very important to your faith. And, you know, it may not seem like a big deal to you because I'm up here nearly every week, you know. But if you miss, sometimes you might miss an, an important block of information in the formation of your faith. You know, I, I, may, I may preach a sermon and then not preach anything even close to being like it for maybe six or seven years or longer. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, and, and if, you, if you miss that, then there's some information that you're not going to have unless you get it somewhere else. And, you know, some of the things that I share, you're going to be hard-pressed to find these things somewhere else, you, especially if you're not looking for them. You know, you say, well, you sure put a lot of value on your preaching. Yes, I do. I do. I spend a lot of time on it. I mean, a lot of time preparing, getting these messages, feeling like I'm getting what, what, what God wants me to say, and sharing with you some things uh, you know, you, if you're new to this church, you may not have ever heard them before in your life, you know, because sometimes I learn things during the week, and then I share them with you on Sunday, and I've been studying the Bible, you know, pretty faithfully uh, for oh, over 50 years now. And so, you know, I mean, uh, sometimes I still learn new things and get excited about them and then share them and share them with you. So I want to thank you for being here. Now, we're, we're going into a season that uh, we have put Satan's kingdom on notice, and we're getting ready for revival. We're going to be praying and fasting leading up to the revival. Uh, we have invited uh, one of the most anointed ministers that I know of in the body of Christ right now, uh, Perry Stone, he's coming here, and he's going to do five services starting Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. You want to go? You want to be here for all five services? You will learn. Uh, he's he's extremely knowledgeable and really had a a big part in me getting an interest in Bible prophecy back in. Um, I guess nine, I guess it was really when it was really strong was probably back around 1988 or 89. That's how I many of you know that's been a while. <laughs> he he played a big part, uh, piquing my interest in in Bible prophecy, and I'm glad to have him coming back to our church. And it's a it's a big endeavor, you know, 
to bring somebody like that, you know, someone that, that uh, is high profile and, you know, you, you've seen them, I'm sure, on television. If you watch uh, Daystar at all, you've seen them over the last few weeks on TV and uh, TBN and, and uh, the Word Network and just about all of them, you know. Very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable, highly anointed, uh, having some of the best meetings any, anywhere, anywhere right now. And he's coming here. Those five services, I'm telling you, you'll want to be here. You want to be here early. You want to bring backsliders with you or people that have grown cold and indifferent, people who, who need to move closer to Jesus. You want to bring them. You want to bring your family members with you because I'm expecting, um, I'm, I'm really expecting dozens and dozens to get saved, hundreds to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I really am. Now, you know, when you do something like this, Satan's kingdom is put on notice that we're just not sitting on our hands, not doing anything, waiting for Jesus to come. And he don't like it. He'll try to attack the church in many different ways. Physically, we've had so much sickness over the last couple of months, I couldn't even start to tell you about it. Our worship team has been attacked physically with all kinds of issues and problems and uh, physical things that are going on and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just a, a lot of stuff. Uh, financially, you know, the enemy wants to attack the church financially uh, because we're, we're making a, a big financial commitment and so on and so forth. And so it's just a, a whole lot. In the middle of this, we gave an offering to Israel. And it was one of the biggest offerings, the biggest offering I think our church has ever given to Israel. So we're not trying to get money to hoard it up or anything like that. Uh, I'm, if I, I would, I'm tempted to show that three-minute video of what our, what our missionary is doing over there, but he's literally in, in the homes where the terrorists came from Gaza up into Israel He's, he's uh, showing what they're doing as about 1,200 in, in one particular kibbutz or town or township or whatever, you know, a little village. Um, 1,200. There's about 100, 100 of them that survive that are going back to try to rebuild. And he's standing in the places where, where they hid and held the door in their safe rooms and the, the bullet holes and the, the places just torn all to pieces. And, and we have been responsible for them uh, to to be able to repair and fix, and we've been given um, stoves and washing machines, and uh, I mean, we've we've just been with televisions, uh, uh, just actually the Church of God, our our fellowship, our denomination, has given over a million dollars since it happened <laughs> to help rebuild in various places in Israel. And I believe our church has given as much or more than any of the churches in regard to this. We've been supporting this ministry to Israel for uh, 31 years now. We were the first church of God to support our ministry to Israel. And so we're doing all of this, and all of this is going on, and, and we've got Satan's attention, all right? And so I'm just telling you, if you have any special offerings to give to House of Prayer International, we are receiving money. <laughs> <laughs> God moves on your heart to give a special offering over the next few weeks to help us with all that we are committing ourselves to for this revival and all that we're continuing to do for Israel. And we will continue. Uh, Amos, our guide for Israel, who is supposed to take us on our tour, he's also the head of a, a terrorist response unit for the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. He contacted me last week and said, it looks like this is going to go at least a year. He said, when we finish in Gaza, we're going to go north to Hezbollah because they have driven the Israelis out of their homes up in the Galilee, uh, up in that region, and they've had to take flight down into central Israel and staying in all of the hotels and everything there. They have no jobs to go back to. They, their, their homes are being destroyed. Uh, one day this past week, 130 missiles were fired from Hezbollah over the border into northern Israel, into these towns. And so he said, when we finish here, it looks like we're going to have to go north up to Hezbollah. And remember, I told you, if you heard, if you heard me uh, preach a couple months ago, how if, if, this, if this goes full scale with Hezbollah, this is Psalm 83. 
And he said, we're going to go north to Hezbollah. And he said, to us, it looks like we're on the brink of World War III. So, and that's somebody who's been fighting in Gaza and somebody who's, who's, who, knows, who knows what's going on with the missiles and everything coming into Israel. But anyways, a lot is going on. Uh, prayer and fasting for the revival is important. Your attendance is important, but you bringing your family and friends is extremely important for the revival. Now, let's get into the Word of God because that's one way that we worship is we declare the worth of His Word. Just by you being here for the sermon, you're declaring to God that His Word is of great worth to you. So I want to get right into, into it. We're going to talk about something that's important. And I'm calling the sermon the power of the covenant. Now, if I had a little more room on the top line on my notes, I would call it understanding the power of the covenant. <laughs> but we're talking about the power of the covenant. First Samuel 18, 3 and 4 says this. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David in his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. All right. And so we're talking about the power of the covenant. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher. In Jesus' name, we ask you, Father, that by your spirit that you would teach us, lead us into all truth. We pray that you would mold us and shape us, Lord, according to your will, and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we begin our investigation into the power of the covenant this morning, I want to start with a definition uh, and explanation and then some examples of what we're referring to when we uh, use the word covenant as it is revealed in the Bible. Covenants are very important in the Bible. When you open your Bible, the first thing you notice is that this wonderful book is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testaments. Now, the New Testament. Now, it could easily be called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant because those two words are pretty much interchangeable when it comes to this. In Bible days, covenants were very important to those living in an agreement with one another concerning some certain things. Probably our best understanding would be the marriage covenant. The marriage covenant. I think that would be something that we would understand, the agreement between two parties. Covenants, contracts, or agreements were made between countries, though, as well as between people. Now, the Old Testament, or covenant, in the first part of your Bible refers to a very important covenant that was made uh, between God and the nation of Israel when the Hebrew people came out of Egypt and camped at Mount Sinai. Most of the Old Testament is about that special covenant between God and Israel. There are other covenants in the Old Testament between God and people, like God's covenant with Adam, Noah, Abraham, David. Uh, but most of the time where you see a reference to God's covenant in the Old Testament, it's referring to God's covenant with Israel, who are the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word covenant then refers to an agreement between two parties where both parties are given certain conditions that must be accepted. According to the Bible, though, God, because of who he is, has a right to set all of the conditions of any covenant that he makes with anybody. It's our obligation to obey these conditions because humans have sinned against God and therefore they do not have the right to demand anything from him. Now, there are important differences between the two major covenants of the Bible. One is called the Old Covenant because it existed for 1,500 years before the new one was given after Jesus died on the cross. The New Covenant of Jesus is also new because it remains in effect even until today, while the Covenant of Moses has been fulfilled in Christ. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament is all about the comparison between these two main covenants in the Bible, the old and the new. Perhaps I should say the contrast, the contrast between the two main covenants in the Bible because the theme of Hebrews is the new covenant is far greater than the old covenant. 
God always knew that the old covenant would be temporary because of the way it was set up, because the old covenant was between God and man, who would never be able to perfectly obey the conditions of the covenant. However, the new covenant is between Yahweh, Jehovah, God, the triune God, and his son, Jesus, who absolutely fulfilled the conditions of the covenant perfectly, that old covenant, and therefore, uh, you know, the old covenant was fulfilled and set aside. Then he fulfilled the conditions of the new covenant, which is still in effect, and it is a, listen, a covenant that cannot be broken. While we don't live under the old covenant today, there are still many great lessons that we can learn from it. All of the things that happened to Israel were given as an example to us, something for us to learn from, according to the apostle. And so, you know, for example, we learn that we must always obey God. We also learn that the Lord is faithful, and although man isn't always 100% faithful, God is 100% faithful to keep all of his promises. That's a good place for an amen. We haven't had one just yet, but right in there. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The old covenant refers to God's covenant with Israel then, and the new covenant refers to God's covenant with all of us who accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's the New Testament. That's the new covenant. And those who are entering into this new covenant by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ then are baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ or the kingdom of God's dear Son, which is his universal church, the invisible church. We learn all about covenants in the Old Testament and love the stories that we find there of those various covenants like the Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And we all seem to love the stories that come from the life of David and the Davidic covenant. David, of course, is the shepherd boy who became the king of Israel. And his story is a true from rags to riches type story. But there's another rags to riches story associated with him and it comes from another covenant that David had not his covenant with God but a covenant that he established with a friend of him and his name was Jonathan and that's what I want to focus on for a little while this morning I want to learn what it means to be in a covenant by examining the covenant that David and Jonathan entered into together, as referenced in our text today in 1 Samuel chapter 18. From it, we will learn about the seriousness of covenants in the Bible. People's lives depended upon covenants. A covenant was the strongest bond that was known to man and had both business and personal applications that extended even to the descendants of the two parties involved. That is what we see in the covenant agreement that David and Jonathan had in the Bible. David and Jonathan made a covenant of friendship and peace that was to last not just throughout their lives, but throughout their descendants forever. An overview of David and Jonathan's covenant agreement would go like this. Number one, in 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 16, we see where King Saul's son, Jonathan, became David's friend. Our text is from that passage that says Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, that's all covenant language. They entered into an agreement that what one had would always be at the other's disposal for the asking. They were like what the old Indians would call blood brothers. Anybody remember, you know, watching all of those things where you, you cut your wrist, he cuts his wrist, you press them together, you know, and the blood intermingles. That was a blood covenant. It was. You know, they're to be friends forever. And 
in the Old Testament, when they entered into these covenants, they exchanged, would exchange weapons, signifying that they would always fight for and protect one another. Now, the problem then arises because Jonathan's father, who was King Saul, the first king of Israel, hated David because David was going to be the one that God was going to give the kingdom to when he stripped it away from King Saul because of his disobedience and rebellion against God. And so Saul was jealous of and hated David because he saw the signs that the, the people's hearts were turning to David and turning away from him. They would sing how Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And Saul was very jealous of the people's love for King David. And Saul decided to kill King David. In 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 10, Jonathan tried to persuade his dad not to kill David. But he failed in his attempt to dissuade Saul. Saul wanted David dead. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, we see more details given of David and Jonathan's covenant, which was thicker than blood. 1 Samuel 20, 12 through 17 says, Jonathan said to David, I make this promise before the Lord, the God of Israel. I promise that I will learn how my father feels about you. I will learn if he feels good about you or not. Then in three days, I will send a message to you in the field. If my father wants to hurt you, I will let you know. I will let you leave in safety. May the Lord punish me if I don't do this. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. As long as I live, show me the same kindness the Lord does. And if I die, never stop showing this kindness to my family. Be faithful to us, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the earth. So Jonathan made this agreement with David and his family, and he asked the Lord to hold them responsible for keeping it. Jonathan loved David as himself, and because of this love, he asked David to repeat this agreement for himself. So David entered the agreement himself. If we were to read the whole story, we'd see where Jonathan warned David to stay away from Saul because Saul was planning to kill David. Saul was very angry with Jonathan when he heard how he had warned David, and Saul even threw a sword at his own son one time because of it. But having been warned by Jonathan of Saul's intent, David fled into the wilderness. Later in the wilderness, when David had an opportunity to kill Saul, we talked about this last week, he spared Saul's life, probably because he honored God's anointing upon Saul as king, but maybe too because David had sworn a covenant with Jonathan that he would always show kindness to Jonathan's family. And so David honored both God and also his covenant with Jonathan by sparing the life of Saul. And Saul, in return, momentarily recognized David's righteousness. But then in 1 Samuel chapter 31, both Saul and Jonathan were killed in a battle with the Philistines at Mount Gilboa. And if you've ever been to Israel with me, you've been to the place at Bet Shan where, uh, where they actually hung Saul's bad, uh, body. It's still, the wall is still there where they hung Saul's body and the, the bodies of his sons. And then, of course, David took his rightful place as the second king of Israel, just as God had promised. And now, we're really going to see the strength of covenants in the Bible, as we said. Covenant agreements even extended past the life of the one making the covenant. Jonathan was dead, but David had such a binding partnership with Jonathan, he wanted to know if Jonathan had any living descendants that David could extend the benefits of their covenant to. So King David asked his advisors if there was anyone left in Jonathan's family to whom he could show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And so they called in one of King Saul's former servants to answer in the matter, and the servant told David of a crippled boy named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son living in a place called Lodabar, about as far from Jerusalem as you could get and still be in Israel. When David became king of Israel, all of King Saul's family fled in fear of their lives, that David would take revenge on them for the way that King Saul had treated David. In their haste to escape, 
a nurse had picked up the five-year-old Mephibosheth to run away with him to protect him. She didn't understand uh, that David would not be a vengeful and paranoid monarch like Saul, his predecessor. So as the nurse who meant well picked up the child Mephibosheth and started running with him, she tripped and they fell on the hard stone floor and broke both of Mephibosheth's legs, crippling him for life. And as the story goes, as the child grew up, his family convinced Mephibosheth that he was crippled because of David. And David was responsible for him being crippled. And so Mephibosheth was afraid of David. And he was afraid David still wanted to kill him. And so upon learning of Mephibosheth's whereabouts, David sent his soldiers to fetch him because he was Jonathan's son. And David wanted to honor his covenant with Jonathan and show kindness to his son. But when they brought him into the presence of the king, Mephibosheth, fearing for his life, bowed in submission before David. And then David reassured him and told him of the covenant that he had with his father, Jonathan. And he restored to Mephibosheth all of King Saul's property and gave him servants to work the land so that Mephibosheth's needs would always be met. And finally, David, who thought that's not enough, he invited Mephibosheth to always come. He, come. he could come and even live in Jerusalem and eat at the king's table whenever he wanted, just like one of the king's own sons. Now, you talk about a rags-to-riches story. Mephibosheth's is just that. It's a beautiful story of kindness and forgiveness that illustrates the depth of a covenant relationship unlike any, any other. And like so many of the Old Testament stories, it is a model of what God, Yahweh, wants to do for you and me. So let's look at the comparisons evident in the story. I want you to think of David as being God, Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, our triune God. Think of Jonathan as being the Lord Jesus Christ. And then think of yourself, you, you and me. We're, we're like Mephibosheth. Now thinking along those lines, I want us to consider our everlasting covenant with God, which according to the writer of Hebrews is far greater than any other covenant established before. Long before you and I were born, the Father and the Son entered into a covenant on our behalf, like David and Jonathan entered into a covenant that was favorable for Mephibosheth. On behalf of everyone who would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ ever, this covenant was entered into between the Father and the Son. A lot of people don't understand that the reason why the old covenant failed is because it was between God and Abraham and his descendants. As we said, covenants carry with them details of conditions. And in God's covenant with Abraham, he said he would protect and provide for Abraham. That would be his part. And all Abraham had to do was walk perfectly before God. And Not going to happen. Do you understand that? God would do his part. But who would be the man that would walk perfectly before God? Now, we know his name is Jesus. <laughs> but we do understand why God's covenant with Abraham and God's covenant with Israel, why, why it, it didn't work until Jesus came. Amen? I mean, Genesis 17 and 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Like I said, where's the gong? Boom. You're out. 
God in return had promised Abraham his offspring would be as the sands of the seashore and the stars of the sky. He will possess the land from the Nile River to the Euphrates and from Mount Hermon all the way down south of the Dead Sea. He promised to bless Abraham himself, and then he promised that, listen, now here it is, through your seed, all of the families, that includes yours and mine, of the earth would be blessed. Of course, God always keeps his end of the agreement, but as far as Abraham's condition of the covenant to walk perfectly before God, no one of the seed of Abraham could ever meet the condition of walking in perfection until Messiah was born after the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary, who, oh, by the way, was a descendant of David and Abraham. And so Jesus, the God-man, came, the Son of God and the Son of Man through Mary. And so he fulfilled the conditions of the Old Covenant. And he fulfilled the conditions of that and he set it aside. And then he made a new covenant between the Father and himself. The new covenant is between Yahweh and Yeshua. It's between Jehovah and Jesus. And this new covenant cannot fail because it's a covenant between the Father and the Son. Neither one is capable of failing. So this is an everlasting covenant. It is a new covenant, and it is a better covenant, and I'm glad that I'm in that one and not in the first one. Amen. That's another good place. Thanks for recognizing a good place to clap or say amen. That's good. So in essence, the new covenant was established as our father said to Jesus, Son, if you'll go down to the earth and live in a body of flesh and bone and blood and die for the sins of men and present your blood as a sacrifice to take away their sins, then I'll forgive them of their sins and give them eternal life with us for." Ever. And Jesus then must have responded saying something like, Father, if you'll forgive them, I'll go. I'll go for us. I'll go and I'll die for them. And so the everlasting covenant was formed and established by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The Bible says this covenant was actually planned and agreed upon before the foundations of the earth were laid as seen in 1 Peter 1 and 20 where it says Christ was chosen before the world was made, but he was shown to the world in these last times for you. The Father and Jesus made this covenant because God knew that each time he entered into a covenant with man, man would prove to be untrustworthy and would soon break it. So God himself had to become a man to provide an acceptable sacrifice to take away the sin and the effects of Adam's sin. Just as Abraham prophesied to Isaac when he took him up Mount Moriah across from Calvary to bind him and place him on an altar to offer him up as a sacrifice if necessary, on the way Isaac said to his father, Father, the wood and the fire, we've got everything we need, but, but where is the lamb? Where is the sacrifice? And in Genesis 22 and 8, Abraham answered, God himself is providing the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. You see, Jesus was born into this world to be a lamb that would be offered to pay the price for the sins of all mankind, you and I. And that's why Revelation 13 and 8, it identifies him as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The foundation is the first thing. Amen? Amen. Until Jesus, the Messiah, would come to fulfill the conditions of the Old Covenant, mankind would always fail in regard to walking before God and being perfect. He would fail. Adam ate the forbidden fruit. Noah's descendants refused to scatter and resettle the earth. The Israelites broke the commandments repeatedly and so on and on. The record of failure of the Old Testament saints goes until Jesus finally 
appears in the world in the New Testament to take away the sins of the world and establish a new covenant in his own blood. But the salvation of mankind as God's children created in his likeness was so important to God that no mere man could be trusted to be faithful. So God himself had to become a man in order to save mankind. The Lord would provide for himself a sacrifice, but I like the King James. It says the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Now listen to me. This whole earth and the entire history of mankind was mapped out and established before God spoke the universe with our solar system, its sun, and the stars and the earth with its moon and all of that into existence. And it's a joke for man to think that he is in control of the affairs of mankind. The truth is Jesus is Lord of God. All. Another good place. To our generation, God prophesies to us in Psalm 2. Listen to this. Why do the heathen rage? That's going on in our world all over the place. All these protesters and all these co- college campuses and these things in the city and, the, and the, whatever they are, the Oscars or, or uh, whatever that is, and them wearing those uh, those red hands showing, you know, the blood of those that were slaughtered by Islam. Red hands, that's what that represents at the Oscars and all the, some of them were even Jews wearing those things. Can you believe that? Some, some of them just got one, put it on, didn't even know what it was, what it, what it was about. But the Jews knew what they were saying. And the Jews knew what they were saying. Why do the heathen rage? I mean, why is all the protest against Israel in response, you know, to, to what has happened? Let something like that happen here. Uh, well, it, well, it kind of did, didn't it, Pearl Harbor? Well, what, what was the response? I said, what was the response? Was it a little bit out of proportion? I'd say so. I mean, you know, you, 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 you can kill your thousands, you know, but, but boy, we respond, we kill millions, you know. But now we're, we're out, the United States is leading the criticism of Israel for imp- not, uh, not having a, a response that's in proportion to what, to what happened. They got to get rid of evil. I mean, they can't have people coming over their border doing, doing these things and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it's a terrible thing, yeah. It, the whole thing is a mess, and the heathen are raging, and Israel's pretty much standing alone right now. Why do the heathen rage? This is to our generation. And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Listen, Israel has to be in that land in order for revelation to be fulfilled, the prophecies of Revelation. And so the devil, in his attempt to keep the prophecies of Revelation, particularly the one where he is bound and and thrown into the eternal lake of fire, from coming to pass. And so he's got to get rid of the Jews, or he's at least got to get the Jews out of the land because the book of Revelation, the prophecies of the tribulation that is to come, It requires the Jews to be in the land in order for them to be punished for their rejection of Jehovah God and cause them to flee down into Jordan, the area below the Dead Sea, Petra, Basra, that area, to be divinely protected where they will turn to God and the remnant of the Jews, uh, probably millions, will get saved. And so there's going to be Gentiles saved during the tribulation. There are going to be Jews saved during the tribulation. And so we, we understand all of that. But the devil, doesn't want, the devil doesn't want the Jews in the land. In fact, he doesn't want the Jews anywhere. He doesn't want them anywhere. And so he fills people's hearts. And the kings of the earth, it's a, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel. This is verse 2. Uh, against the Lord. And against his anointed, say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. 
Here's God's response to what's going on right now. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion that's still yet to come. We sing about it in the Christmas carols. He rules the world with truth and grace. How many of you know that you're singing prophecy about the, about the millennial reign of Christ? And makes the nations prove the glories of his righteous. That's, you know, that's prophetic of what God's going to do. This has all been established at the foundation of the world. God laughs when people think they can stop Bible prophecy from coming to pass. He shall speak to them in his wrath. And one day he's going to set his king upon his holy hill just like he has promised. He said, I will declare the decree in verse 7. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. The whole earth will belong to King Jesus. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. In other words, accept Jesus as your Lord. Kiss the Son. Receive Jesus, Messiah, as your Savior. Kiss the Son. Enter into covenant with him. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This world is in for a rude awakening. They are turning on Israel, the brethren of the Lord, one by one, conspiring to divide up God's land and rid the earth of the people of Israel, scheming to replace them with other than the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision, just as we read in verse 4. He will laugh at them, mock them, and they will be held in contempt for their rebellion against the maker of the heavens and the earth. God planned for the salvation of mankind and the world through the blood of Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world was established, he will one day set his king on the throne of the earth after the rapture and the tribulation. God's plan for the salvation of creation will come to pass as John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. That's cosmos. That's everything that he created. Remember, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, which is actually the renovation of the uh, atmospheric heaven of this earth. This earth is going to be renovated. It's going to be changed. It'll be destroyed first by fire, not by water, because in the Noahic covenant, he said, I'll never again destroy the earth with a flood but he will destroy it with a fire and he will create then a new earth and a new atmospheric heaven and the new Jerusalem will come down to rest over this new earth and we will live and reign with our God forever, our eternal God in his eternal city, forever and ever. Wow, what a plan. Mankind sinned over and over again, constantly failed to meet the necessary conditions to live in a covenant with God. But he didn't cast us aside. He didn't destroy us and, and start uh, all over by creating another race of people beside the human race somewhere else. But instead he pursued us, you and I. And he, and, and he, he loved us and, and he wanted to save us. Even when mankind ran from him and postured uh, themselves as the enemies of God, he kept reaching out to them in love. Now back to our story. Mephibosheth, he had been warned and was told stories of what would happen to him if David ever got his hands on him. No doubt he even heard the stories of David's wrath and his violence as David's armies destroyed their enemies. Tens of thousands of them with, were destroyed by David, it's, as the song goes, with his own sword. Just like mankind has been told that God is responsible for our infirmities. You know, people blame God. 
They blame God for all the bad things that happen in the earth. Mankind's been told that God's responsible. The Jews as a nation have totally rejected God almost. People don't know that that over 90% of the people that live in Israel are atheists and agnostics. You just see the pictures of the ones with the black hats and the long gowns and the curls and all of that, you know, and praying the prayer. Well, most of the people over there are just absolutely totally backslid. I mean, you know, it's like a... You know, it's like, it's like a, a big New York City or something, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's not what you think it is. They're not saved yet. Nobody gets saved unless they accept Jesus. Do you understand that? The Messiah came. They rejected him. One of the main reasons for the tribulation is going to be to, to break uh, the will of these stiff-necked people. I'm just calling them what God called them, all right? And so their will's going to be broken. And then the remnant of the Jews, millions of them, are going to turn back to God because of the preaching of the two witnesses and also the 144,000 evangelists that will be preaching the word in Israel. And so, so we need to understand that God isn't responsible. God was not responsible for the Holocaust. That's why the Jews have a hard time believing in the love of God and believing in the existence of God. If, if God existed, then he would not have allowed the Holocaust. And, and some people are probably thinking if God existed, he would not have allowed what happened just recently in Israel. You know? And so mankind you know, thinks if God ever got, gets his hands on us, he'll surely punish us for our sins. Because we don't think of God as love. A lot of people don't. I'm just telling you. They don't, they don't look at the God of the Bible as a God of love. But he is. He's not looking to punish everyone. He's looking to save everyone. It is his will that all would be saved. Like Mephibosheth, finding himself before King David after all those years of wonder and confusion about what that encounter would be like, many of us remember the time when we finally were confronted by God and we felt his presence and were aware of him. And some of us remember how we trembled at the presence of God in fear because of our broken relationship with him. But instead of his anger, we encountered his love like Mephibosheth. Instead of David's anger, when he finally came face to face with him, he encountered his love. We encountered the love and acceptance of the Son of God, Jesus, Messiah. And when we heard the message of the new covenant with God simply through us accepting Jesus as Savior and Lord and putting our trust in him, God restored the inheritance that had been lost because of man's disobedience. And God invites us to dwell with him in his new Jerusalem. And God invites us to eat at the king's table with his family and literally to become one of his adopted children. The New Testament tells us how we accomplished this. In John 1 and 12, we're told that because we believe in Jesus, we've been given the authority, listen, to become the children of God. That's what it says. It says in John 1 and 12, but some people did accept him. They believed in him, and he gave them the right to become the children of God. That's you and I. Having been born once in the flesh to our earthly parents, he gave us the opportunity to be born again by the Spirit so that he could become our heavenly Father and you and I could become the sons and daughters of God. He did this simply because we chose to believe in his Son as John 3.16 that we already mentioned said. All we had to do was believe on Jesus and confess our sins and, our Savior, and confess him as our Savior and Lord. And when we did, we entered into this new covenant, this new and living way provided for all through Jesus Christ. And we have a covenant with God because of our faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 and 29, God knew them before he made the world. 
And he decided they would be like his son. Then Jesus would be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Look at someone next to you, around you, behind you, and say, You are Jesus' brother. Or you are Jesus' sister. Hallelujah. God, through the giving of Jesus, his son provided a way that you and I become members of the royal family. And that's why Jesus is called the first fruits. He made Jesus to be like us so that we could be like him. And he adopted us us as his sons and his daughters. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad to be a part of the family of God. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the right time came, God sent a son who was born from a woman and lived under the law. God did this so that he could buy the freedom of those who were under the law. God's purpose was to make us his children. Since you are now God's children, he has sent the Spirit of his son into your hearts. The spirit cries out, Abba, Father. Now you are not slaves like before. You are God's children, and you will receive everything he promised his children. Because of our faith in Jesus, we have been legally adopted into God's family. We are now the sons and daughters of God. Our inheritance has been restored, and we get to eat at the king's table. Like Mephibosheth who went from rags to riches as David invited him to be as one of his own family members. We have been adopted as the sons and daughters of God. And we move from the rags of sin and condemnation to the riches of God's love, mercy, and grace. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son, but he was living in a place called Lodabar, about as far from the king's table as one could find himself. Imagine that. As far from the king's table as one could find himself. That's where he lived. But because of the strength of Jonathan's covenant with David, after Jonathan's death, Mephibosheth was made rich, invited to eat at the king's table for the rest of his life. But our covenant the new covenant between Yahweh and Jesus that we are allowed to enter into simply by faith in Jesus is far better than any other covenant known to man because our new covenant, since Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day, because of it we've all been made rich beyond compare and we have a seat at the king's table. Because of the new covenant, the Bible tells us that we have become joint heirs with Jesus Christ of the riches of the inheritance of the righteous. Paul gives us more detail in, in Ephesians 1, 19 through 22. And you will know that God's power is very great for us who believe it is the same as the mighty power he used to raise Christ from death and put him at his right side in the heavenly places. He put Christ over all rulers, authorities, powers, and kings. He gave him authority over everything that has power in this world or in the next world. God put everything under Christ's power and made him to be the head of everything for the church. You're in the body of Christ and everything in the world has been placed beneath the body of Christ. Are you listening? The very lowest person in the body of Christ. You might think you're the heel in the body of Christ. You might think you're the big toe or the little toe in the body of Christ, but the heel and the big toe and the little toe in the body of Christ has power and authority and promises that put you above all of the enemies that can come against you. The principalities of powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. You have been given mighty weapons mighty weapons to tear down the strongholds of the enemy over your life and over your family. Employ those weapons and use those weapons. Speak the truth. Speak the word. I am a child of God. I have no fear. I am a child of God. God will not withhold anything from me. I am a child of God. I am blessed and highly favored. I am a child of God. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Speak the word. Believe the word. Listen, you've got benefits to this covenant. 
great benefits. God has raised us up, he says in one place, and caused us to sit. Right now, God sees us. He sees you and me as we are sitting in the throne of God with Jesus Christ made to sit in heavenly places according to the scriptures. And he did all of this that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us because of the covenant between Jesus and God that we enter into just simply by faith. All we got to do is accept him as Lord, accept him as Savior. I'm telling you, we have got great privileges in this world and in the world to come. We'll be in the king's table in the king's city, hallelujah, for the endless ages. Give God praise in his house today. He raised us up. Now, that's in the past perfect tense, meaning in God's view. We're already there. We're walking around like the devil's got us all beat down. Well, how you doing? Oh, the devil's been on my back all day long. It's been a heavy burden. Well, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to stand up and get that thing off your back. You're a child of God. You're a son or a daughter of the king. Amen? Hallelujah. You've been given authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means harm you. The scripture says that. So even though at one time we were dead in our sins, and by nature objects of God's wrath, hopeless, helpless, worthless, and useless, he made us alive in Christ Jesus. And he gave us a new covenant that cannot be broken. Because it's between Yahweh and Yeshua. And we just enter into it by faith in Jesus. Confess him as our Savior and confess him as our Lord. And walk with him daily. Hallelujah. Through this world. And I'm going to say it until one day. We're walking on pure, transparent gold. <laughs> he forgave us of our sins. He clothed us in robes of righteousness, seated us beside his son in the heavenly realm, and he made us kings and priests who will reign on the earth and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Through faith in him, we've entered into his covenant with God. We have gone from the rags of sin to the riches of heaven. That's the strength and the power of your covenant with God. I wonder how the world would be changed if everyone in the body of Christ really understood this and really lived like someone who was under the lordship of Jesus, walking in the spirit, doing the work and the will of God as we serve him in this world by serving one another. I wonder how our world would be changed. I'm reminded of a story one time of a, a young man that went into the Marines. They signed all up and he got in there and he went to camp, whatever they call it, and he's put in line, and out come the drill sergeant. He said, I want every one of you dumbbells to take a step forward. And everybody stepped forward except for him. Drill sergeant said, what, what's, what's going on here? What do you think about this? And the guy said, well, I think there sure are a lot of them. <laughs> if Satan calls you a dumbbell, you say what he said. I'm not a dumbbell. I'm a Marine. <laughs> I 
I'm not a dumbbell. I'm a child of God. I'm not a dumbbell. I'm a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, who is my Savior and my Lord. I'm not a nobody. I'm a somebody. I'm a somebody because... Of Jesus. That may be the only reason, but that makes me no less than a somebody in the eyes of God. I'm sitting in heavenly places right now in the throne with God and Jesus. I got lots more notes, but you don't have a lot more time. Your new covenant is something you should celebrate every day of your life. You understand that? Every day of your life, celebrate your new covenant with God because of Jesus, your Savior, and your Lord. Teresa, why don't the music team come on up? We're going to worship just a little bit before we go. Every head bowed for just a moment. How many of you want to make sure that Jesus is your Savior and Lord and that you accept God's invitation to enter into this new agreement, this new covenant with him and all the blessings that he promises because of it? Would you just raise your hand right now? Yes, God sees your hand. He sees your hand. He sees your hand. Okay, you can put your hand down. God says, He who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I think it would be good for every one of us just to confess that Jesus is our Lord. Say, Father, I thank you that you love me so much that you gave your son to establish a new covenant that I can be a part of simply by trusting in him. And God, the blessings of this covenant are wonderful. I have you with me in my heart by faith in Jesus every moment of every day. And I have promises, not only of blessings in this life and in this world, but I have promises, God, of blessings throughout my existence, throughout eternity, because of Jesus and his blood that was shed for the remission of my sins and because I'm trusting in him. Jesus, I trust in you and your sacrifice on my behalf. The blood that you shed to take away my sins, I trust in you and I accept you as my Savior, the Lamb of God that takes away my sins. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Stand with us and let's worship. Let's sing this song. Bow down and worship.